Hey everybody, Johnny here. In this video, we're going to take a look at a way that I've found to import shape keys into geometry nodes. So what we're going to do is take a simple switch model that I've created, create a grid of them like this, and then randomly assign different shape keys to each instance of that switch. So let's jump right into it. So we're going to start with this extremely simple model that I've put together here. As you can see, it's just a box with this pole coming out of it. And this will be a simple switch. If I go into side view and select this pole, and I have my rotation set around the 3D cursor, and all I did was select this bottom face here, do cursor to selected, and then change my pivot point from median point to 3D cursor. Now if I select this whole pole and rotate it, you can see I can rotate it like a switch. Now for this particular example, I really only want this switch to be in one of two positions, either flipped up or flipped down. Um, if I wanted to put it in more or do some other things, I could certainly do that. Just the simplicity of this example, I want to put it in two positions. And I want to bake those two positions into shape keys. So what I'll do is in side view, I will come over here to my uh, data properties and add a shape key. This shape key will be the basis. And what we'll do is we'll have the basis be just it standing straight up like this. We'll add one key here. And with this key selected, we will rotate the switch down here. We'll add a second key. And on that one, we'll rotate the switch over here. And now we can see if we click between these, we have our three shape keys. We can then click on one of these and change the value and you can see that this is doing that without any trouble. So next, let's make an array of these switches. So we have like a control panel with a whole bunch of switches. For that, we'll go into our geometry node editor here. We'll add a new node tree to this object. Now there's a couple different ways we could do this. For this example, I'm gonna use the repeat zone to create my copies. So I'll add in a repeat zone and the output of the repeat zone is what we're going to be outputting. And now every time we go through the repeat zone, we want to add in a new one of these switches. We will do a join geometry and we'll connect in our switch. While you can't see it here, if I were to up these iterations, you'll see that my vertex count is going up, but you're not seeing anything because these are all just being stacked on top of one another. So we need to space these out. We can do that using a transform geometry node on our newly created geometry. So I'll add a transform geometry here. And we just want to mess with the translation. So first off, we want to make a line of these. So we're going to want to affect the X position. So we'll do a combine XYZ. And for each one, we'll want to change this X position. So if we were to take the iteration here, and plug it into X, you'll see that not much happens. But if I were to add a math node and set this to multiply, you'd see that I can now create multiple copies of this. How do I know what value that I should put here? Well, I want these to be spaced out perfectly uh, by the width of this object. So I can do that by getting the bounding box of my object. This will give me the dimensions of my box in the X, Y, and Z uh, components. I bring my incoming geometry and add a bounding box node to it. And then what I wanna do is I want to find the difference between the minimum and the maximum points on my object. So kind of the two opposite corners of the bounding box. And I can do that just by subtracting the minimum from the maximum. So if I say minimum and I subtract, so I've got the maximum minus the minimum. This vector output here is the size of my object. So if I separate the X, Y, Z of this, I can get at just the X size of my switch. And now if I plug that into my multiply, you can see that now these are lined up perfectly by the width. So that takes care of like our line of switches. Now let's make it into a 2D grid of switches. So we're gonna want to affect uh, the Y position as well. First, we wanna decide how many objects do we want 
per row. And so then we can repeat this position based on that limit. So say we want to have five switches and then go to the next row, we would need to change this iteration from zero to nine, which it's doing right now, to zero to four, and then just keep repeating zero to four over and over and over. We can do that using the integer modulo operator. You can think of the integer modulo operator as when you would do division, when you were first starting out doing arithmetic, and you would say something like, what is five divided by two? Well, you would say five divided by two, two can go into five twice, but then there's a remainder of one. Well, that remainder is the integer modulo. So we can add an integer math node here and we'll set the mode to modulo. And this bottom number will be the number we are dividing our number by. So in this case, if we have 10 iterations, this will be whatever iteration we're currently on divided by this number. So when the iteration is one, and you say one divided by five, five goes into one zero times, but it has a remainder of one. The result of each of these iterations, zero through nine, will be divided by five, and the remainder of those operations is going to be output. So this is going to be zero, one, two, three, or four. And we multiply the width that we got off the bounding box by zero, one, two, three, and four, and that becomes the X component of each one of these. But with 10 iterations here, that means we should have 10 switches, but we only have five. We actually do have 10 switches, but they're overlapping because that X component has gone back to zero, one, two, three, and four times the width again. So it's on those subsequent repeats through this number being given back by the modulo that we want to be on different rows. So how do we determine the row? If we take the other half of integer division, which is just the whole number of times the denominator goes into the numerator, then we can determine what row we're on. So if we're on iteration three and we divide by five, well, five goes into three zero times, and so we're gonna be on row zero. But once we get to the iteration numbered five, which because we start at zero, that becomes the sixth object. Well, five divided by five is one. So now that is going to go on row one. And because the rows are starting at zero, that will be the second row. So if we take the iteration number and we do an integer math, we can do a divide here and say integer math divide, and we set this to five as well, this number will be the row that we want to be outputting to. Here, we'll set the Y component of our transform geometry, duplicate the multiply node here, take the Y component of our bounding box, and multiply that by our row. And then we can set our Y component of our transform geometry to that. Now, since we are multiplying the row number times the Y component, the switches line up perfectly up and down. And as we increase the iterations, we continue to get more and more rows of five switches. To have more control of this, connect the value that we're dividing by and moduloing by into our group input. Also, we'll connect the iterations to our group input. So from here, we can choose how many switches we are going to create. We'll say 100, and then how many switches there are per row, and we can say 10. That gives us a grid of 10 by 10 switches. So here's where we can bring in my new idea. If we want to set each one of these switches randomly, by using its shape key, here's how we can accomplish that. I'm going to bring in two bake nodes, and I'll connect them both to my group input geometry. If I come over now to the mesh data and choose one of my shape keys and turn up its value, all of my switches respond to that because 
the shape keys take effect before they enter the geometry nodes. It's at this point I can capture that shape key using one of these bake nodes. If I take this top bake node and press bake, this bake node now contains this shape key. Let's go ahead and reset this shape key back to zero and set key two to the value of one. So now the switch is going the other direction and I'll bake my second bake node and I'll shut off this shape key as well. So now this is just showing the basis key once again. So now if I come back into shaded mode here so that I can see the results of my viewer node, if I control shift click on one of these bake nodes, the state that that was in when I baked it is now shown. If I click on the other one, you'll see I get this other state. If I click on this reroute node that comes before these, you'll see that I'm getting the incoming geometry. That means that these two nodes now contain my two shape keys. And this gives me a lot of interesting things that I can do. For simplicity's sake, all I'm going to do is randomly choose between one or the other instead of using my incoming geometry for my duplicates. For that, I will drag this out and add a switch node and connect in both of my shape key geometries. And then I'll pipe that output to my transform geometry here. If I toggle my switch node, you'll see that all of these now respond using the shape key that I've baked. And to randomize this, I'm going to add a random value node and I'll set it to Boolean. I'll connect that here, but because geometry only takes a single value and the, and the random value node outputs a field, I need to set a static ID here in order for this to be a static number. And the ID that I want to set is simply my iteration number. And now my switches are randomly switched on and off. We'll go ahead and clean up our nodes here. So up top we have our shape key selection. And down here we have the position where we're going to be putting each one of our duplicates. And then right here we have our probability that one is going to be up or down. So we've really accomplished two different things here. We've one made a grid of these objects that are all connected in a very compact way. And then second, we've chosen shape keys for each one of them based off a random true or false. As I was working on this idea, I found that going back and forth between working on the shape keys and then rebaking them over and over again was kind of a hassle. So I did make a, an extension that can do this for you. So here I can do uh, F3 to search and do uh, bake shape keys to geometry nodes. And you can see that it creates a bake node for each one of my shape keys. And it goes through each one of those, setting each shape key to one and then baking the associated node. So if I were to control shift click on these, you would see there's my basis, my key one, and my key two. And on future runs of this operator, if there's already a bake node named the same as your shape key, it's just going to rebake that one instead of recreating another bake node. I could come up here with these and plug in. And instead of using these, I could use these here. And then if I were to make adjustments to my shape keys, uh, let's say, let's say I come in here and, and I delete my keys here and then I create new ones. And instead of it being a flip switch, it's more of like a dip switch. Currently you won't see any changes because my bake nodes are still baked off of my old shape keys. Well, to fix that, I would simply come back here and since my keys are still named key one and key two, I can hit F3, rerun my bake shape keys to geometry nodes, and now those two are appropriately baked. 
All right, so there you have it. It was kind of an odd, uh, off-the-cuff idea that I had, and I was able to put this together. If you're interested in this little script that I wrote, it is available on my extension repository. I will put a link down in the description where you can go and uh, install that for free, try it out, and see if you could come up with some interesting uses for this technique. If you're finding any of my tutorials or scripts useful and you want to support uh, further development, further tutorials, you can go ahead and you could jump on over to my Patreon and you can support me over there or you can join the YouTube channel as well. Anyway, thanks for watching. I hope this video inspires you to make something awesome. And until next time, I'll catch you later.